Guys, so here we go with game numero uno in the Empire Collective Cup Platinum League between Chris and Juan. Get hyped, get ready for what is going to be an awesome set of games, I sincerely hope. And as we go into game number one, uh, the Empire Collective Cup Light Pack, uh, we pull out of the bag, we pull out of the, the bag of maps, the eight maps in the bag. We get Hideout, which is a really cool map, and uh, one that we I've not seen that often at uh, a very high level, a uh, very high competitive level. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this one goes down, and I'm looking forward to see this set of games because, man, Chris is here. Chris, the man, the myth, the legend, he is here, and... Um, Man, Chris is such an AOC legend. He really is. He's been around for so many years. He is so good at this game. And uh, he's just, you know, he's a seasoned expert when it comes to AOC. You know, his rivalry with Doubt lasting many years and being just, just so awesome. And here he is still in 2015, still playing away, still kicking butt. And uh, <laughs> here he is over to the left of the map in the green playing as the Mongols. Uh, uh, could I kiss his feet anymore? <laughs> I don't think so. Not if, not even if I tried. Uh, but of course, over to the right of the map, a very, very, very worthy opponent in the hot pink. We have Juan, and he is playing as the Spanish here. Um, obviously, non sieves for game one. Juan, the Argentinian player, who is kicking also a lot of butt recently, um, playing a lot of 1v1s, a lot of team games, um, generally a very good all-round player, and, you know, I'm... I'm just, yeah, I'm hyped. I'm hyped for this set of games, to be honest with you guys. I really am. Uh, Juan in the hot pink as well. Chris in his token green. Uh, Mongols versus uh, Spanish, and it's great to see, like, th th again, we have another sieve that is not Mongols. Like, all, th all four sets that we've seen so far, someone has chosen the Mongols for game one. And the other guy's always chosen something different. Like, we've seen Celts, we've seen Persians, we've seen now Spanish, and we saw, uh, what else did we see? I can't even remember what else we saw, but that's pretty cool that these guys are playing so much variety. Yet yeah, always, someone is always choosing the Mongols still, which is kind of cool. Um, I don't know, we'll see how this one goes down. Uh, I also want to say thank you to Search Engine Revs for sponsoring a whole thousand dollars to this event. Um, they're awesome. They're awesome for what they've done. And uh, you guys can check out more information about them below the stream. They're an SEO company that helped SEO, uh, help companies, other companies, do SEO uh, online to get themselves seen on the internet. So uh, check them out, info and stuff below. Um, well, yeah, so in we go with Hideout then. This is kind of a nice map, you know? Like, this, there's quite a lot you can do on this map, and it's always nice to imagine this as being reverse or inverse arena because it is similar to arena in a sense because you know you've got the kind of starting positions and the original version of hideout actually had walls around it i believe but uh, this version obviously has the walls removed oh chris off to a little bit of an interesting start here a little late bringing that second boar in actually and his villagers there gathering some wood for a moment until the boar came in uh, he didn't want to start on a new sheep because that would mean that he let the sheep rot. And you know what? Given that he is... Oh, he's taking deer out on the left side as well. Yeah, I was going to say, given that he's taken the second boar so early and with so many villagers, and given that he's taking deer on the left side, looks like we are going to see a drush coming in. This barracks is going up slightly, slightly late, but that's not too much of a worry. Uh, also on the right side, Juan here. No Drusherino, not yet, but he is certainly starting to wall this up. And uh, he's actually got a pretty easy wall. If you look at the distance he has to wall, not very far. If you look at the distance that Chris has to wall, yeah, it's a little further a little further for him to do that, a little further afield. So this Drush could be risky, and if we have a look at Chris's scouting, he's scouted around the right side, obviously seeing no walling there, but he's not actually spotted the left side yet, and he's not seeing that those wobbles are coming up. Surprisingly, almost amazingly, Juan right now is uh, not looking too good in terms of food income. He's uh, actually not taking his deer. He's actually not found two of his sheep. Two of these sheep have still not been found. Juan has not explored this area very well. And although he's explored Chris's side of the map, he has not actually found his own sheep yet. And as a result, he's already farming. He's got 
six villagers on berries, and his feudal age time, well, it's going to be pretty slow. But not because he wants a fast feudal, uh, not because he wants a uh, slow feudal time, but because he's planning on doing a fast castle. Hence why he's walling up like this, and uh, hence why he is making a bunch of farms right now and continuing to add villagers in to gold and uh, continuing to just queue them up at the TC. This drush from Chris, well, is it a full drush? Yeah, he's done three militia. That's pretty much a full drush. He doesn't look like he's got um, Loom back at home. And meanwhile, on the right side, these scouts are kind of chasing each other down. Uh, Chris, of course, losing out here, which is not so ideal when he's getting aggressive with the militia on the left side. Quan gonna just wall up behind this and prevent this drush from doing any damage and it's easily prevented. Dr Chris's drush, maybe a little late, maybe a little slower than he would have liked, but I think the Huan would have still had that walled up successfully anyway, and uh, as a result, Chris is um, essentially kind of wasted these resources here, and Huan should be able to do a better fast castle off of the back of this, because obviously he's saved all of that food, he's saved a little bit of that gold, and uh, right now, 29 population, that's uh, 28, 28 whole villagers as he goes up to the feudal age. And if this isn't a fast castle, then I don't know what it is, but obviously it is a fast castle. And you know, the um, Spanish really have a, a pretty bad feudal age, you know? So it's either a drush into a fast castle or it's a straight up fast castle for the Spanish. And what he's doing right here is Pretty expected, I would say, to say the least. I'm just surprised he didn't take his deer earlier. Um, obviously, you see Chris on the left side. He actually milled those deer, and he's also milled his berries. So he's built an additional mill, but it's worth it for the deer. And even though Juan has uh, not had to spend as much food yet because he's not made these militia, um, the fact that Chris has taken his deer sooner and he's playing as the Mongols means that his villages have been a little more efficient, and uh, that is obviously uh, gonna work in his favor. Uh, Chris then going up with 30 villagers, Juan going up on 28, and uh, the plan for Juan, oh, oh, I like that one, the plan for Juan is obviously to make a castle um, once he gets to the castle age. Now, we'll see whether he's really gonna be rushing to make that castle or if he'll build two TCs first. Um, it's probably more likely at this stage that he will build two TCs first and then build the castle. I might be wrong, but given that he's got a full wall and he's not really feeling any pressure at the moment, aside from these few militia, um, I think Juan's going to just comfortably go up to two TCs or three TCs and then build the castle after that. But on, he, on, he, wait, on, his, on his... What? <laughs> I can't speak. On he goes to the castle age. And meanwhile, Chris back at home doing bit acts right now uh, to keep that wood flow coming in. He's got plenty of food, of course, and uh, clicking up to the castle edge himself as he builds an archery range and a blacksmith. No market for Chris here. Another archery range coming up, and it seems like he's going to gear himself now towards going archers. And you can see he's got six villagers on the gold there, archer production coming out. And he's probably, you know, he's probably anticipating this kind of build order from Juan. I mean, that's for sure. And if you have a look, and this is, this is really good. And Chris is just so aware. I mean, he had a really good idea that this is what Juan was going to do. And knowing that Juan is going to probably do that castle, what he's done is he's placed some palisades down around this stone. And that's not because he wants to try and wall it up. Of course, he knows he can't get through these walls, but it's because these palisades do give vision and he can actually see. If you look at Chris's fog of war, he can see those villagers there, which just confirms to him that Juan is going to be building that castle once he's up to the castle age. And Juan right now, you can see there with uh, six villagers on the stone, um, clearly saving for that 650. And once he's done that, the castle will be coming up. But obviously, in Chris's situation, he's either got the choice to go knights or he's got the choice to go crossbow. And if you had to choose between knights and crossbow, I think crossbow are more favorable when fighting against uh, the conquistadors that we're expecting to see from Juan. And the reason for that is because if you've seen um, conquistadors in action, if you've seen conquistadors and good micro of conquistadors, you'll know that they can absolutely shred knights like really quickly, very easily. So Juan then, what's he doing? 
Well, he's actually going for the castle straight away. It seems I was wrong. I thought he'd go for the TCs and then the castle. Maybe his decision was influenced by the fact that these archers are here, meaning that he can't realistically wall up behind this without losing any more villagers. And uh, these militia are slowly but surely breaking their way through this wall. Uh, so the castle coming straight up and obviously a siege workshop as well. Um, so right now, Juan, because of his scout back here, uh, seeing these two archery ranges, because of the crossbows attacking his, his house, he knows what's coming his way. He's got time to prepare for this. And this is really the power of walls in AOC. The power of walls just allowing you to prepare, allowing you to um, really get ready for what your opponent is going to be sending your way. Chris back at home. Building his second and third TC straight away, and of course he can do that since, well, he's not interested in getting a castle out just yet. Uh, later on, of course, castles are going to be really important for him as he tries to go down the Mangodai route, no doubt. But the game's got to get that far, and um, in this situation, uh, crossbows going to be decent against these conquistadors. The problem is the Manganel here, and uh, Chris is not going to be able to push in either. Bear in mind now that this castle is in a fantastic location to lock down this area of the map. If Chris comes in on this left side, if he comes in too close on the right, of course he's going to get absolutely destroyed by this castle. And Juan pushing out with a few conks, moving out with these Manganels, then he may as well just keep pushing. He may as well just keep pushing, because unless Chris comes out with some uh, counter to the Manganels, either a Manganel of his own or some other unit, such as maybe a Knight or a Light Cavalry, which is going to be very unlikely, um, Chris cannot realistically fight this unless he has some insane micro going on. Um, so Juan may as well keep pushing and may as well try and pressure some of these TCs. And if you look at the difference here, Juan... Not really, not really looking to get that second TC either. He's actually looking to get another castle by the looks of things. He's coming forwards here to build a house. Um, that's obviously just to group his villagers together. He's still got six villagers on stone. And he's at 500 stone at the moment. So I'm expecting we'll see a castle drop on the front from Juan in just a minute. And Chris, even if he goes for counter Manganels now, he might have a pretty hard time dealing with that. And uh, Juan might be able to take down a castle from Chris. There's the Manganels, uh, well, sorry, the Siege Workshop from Chris though. And obviously he's now falling back, knowing all too well that he cannot out-micro two Manganels without taking some heavy losses. Um, so, Spanish now looking really strong. And you've got to bear in mind, the real difference here is that Chris has gone up to three TCs. You know, he's he's doing a mini boom at this stage with three TCs. I mean, maybe not even a mini boom, like kind of a, a full boom almost. And as a result, although yes, he's investing a lot in crossbows, he is not really investing in a lot of military overall. I mean, he's, he's quite slow to get this siege workshop out, for instance. Um, if he can defend, however, if he can keep his TCs intact, if he can keep his villagers safe, then, of course, he might start pulling an advantage as his economy takes lead, takes the advantage, and uh, starts to pull in a lot more resources for him. Chris then sees this castle on the right side. Bodkin Arrow is already done, so he can push those villagers away. And a bit of solid micro on the left side as well, managing to take down that Manganel. Now, if Chris can find another Manganel kill, then this could be all over for Juan on the front. He's deleting his own house in favor of getting to those villagers and denying that castle. But in come the conquistadors, and uh, obviously they are fantastic at taking down siege. But a 16 attack, just going to come up there and blast them in the face. And Juan will successfully complete the castle on the right-hand side. Nice attempt by Chris there. Um, I think it was the right thing for Juan to bring the Manganel on the right and bring the conks on the left. And now that castle is up. Um, it's certainly going to allow Juan to continue to, to push in from this position. Obviously, it's not going to cover too many resources. Um, it's not going to deny Chris any gold or anything like that. But it will make it a real difficulty for Chris now to push out of his base. Um, it's going to mean that he's, he's got to kind of have to deal with this problem at hand. Uh, Juan isn't going to stop there either. He's taking more stone on the front now. Um, he's got these five villagers, of course, just going to gather some more stone. Back at home, he's finally putting up his second TC. And um, the villager count at this stage is uh, nine in uh, the favor of Chris. So Chris has nine more villagers.
but still, Juan looking great. Watchtower coming up on the front as well, and just, you know, a casual 26 minute rush. A wheelbarrow coming in for Juan, maybe a little late there, 26 minutes, but he's really started farming more now. So getting wheelbarrow at this stage is definitely worth it. I mean, wheelbarrow is always worth it um, at the end of the day. On this left side, of course, Chris is going to be able to kill some conks. If you can fight them with his crossbows, that's great. And you have to bear in mind that um, crossbows do outrange them. Um, I think a little more cost effective against them when they've got numbers and obviously you don't need a castle to build crossbows as well But I mean Juan is looking really nice at the moment. This tower though doesn't seem doesn't seem destined to be completed Unless Juan of course can push in with his mangonels and with his uh, conks here on the left side But now with two castles out Juan can obviously make a lot of conquistadors at the moment his eco is basically geared up for making conks he's got uh, a few villagers out here on gold, seven. He's uh, making loads of farms, or he has made a load of farms. And he's only just getting that third TC up now. So instead of taking food and building villages, he took food and he built a lot of conquistadors. And maybe that's paying off as he flattens two mangonels very quickly. He tanks up these uh, these archers here. And wow, another mangonel going down. Chris losing a whole bunch there as Juan Mac backs away, micros his way out of that fight. And uh, he lost, what, three, six conquistadors? Right there, seven conquistadors, but he took down three mangonels, and he still got out with a few conquistadors alive. Um, that was pretty solid from plan, in my opinion. Um, obviously now Chris starting to do some skirms, and even they, even they, are going to struggle against the 16 attack of the conks. And this is why crossbows, I think, are probably the favorable unit in this situation. But uh, Juan, losing a few a few conquistadors there, but um, certainly worth taking down three mangonels in my opinion, leaving him to get the advantage in mangonel count and start pressuring this TC now on the right hand side. Um, so <laughs> this TC under pretty heavy fire. And uh, on the left side, Chris here trying to wall this up. He's going to succeed in getting a gate up and trying to keep these conquistadors out because he's getting a little overwhelmed, I feel, I feel, at the moment. Chris finally getting a castle up though, and you know, oftentimes if you're under this much pressure, a castle can really help you to fend it off. These mangonels, of course, they can't get close, they're just going to get killed off by a castle very, very quickly. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I say Tato. I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong, but I'm stubborn, all right? <laughs> I know it's Tato. I know it's Tato. You can forgive me, though, surely. You can forgive me. Um, so let's just have a quick look at the village account here, and you'll see that Juan has actually caught up in villagers quite quickly. He's on 68 versus Chris's 69. Now they're completely even. So even though Juan delayed that second and third TC for a while, He's actually neck and neck in village accounts so far. Juan killing 27 units, just losing 17. And of course now running away there because there's uh, Elite Skamsher out for Chris. Fully upgraded in the Castle Age. And uh, even with Conquistadors here, it's going to be a little dicey fighting against Elite Skams. Now obviously, you know, he was fine dealing with Standard Skams. Now they're Elite, it's a little bit harder. And Chris going to successfully get a castle on the left hand side. But you can see how this game is sort of really favoring Juan at the moment. He's sitting here with really nice map control. He's kind of got Chris sitting back, as it were. Um, and Chris now trying to just regain some numbers, trying to just defend from these guys. And uh, in comes Juan with a mangonel on the left side. Chris going to get out of the way just in time. Juan trying to tap ground there to try and catch some of these units out. But like I say, couple of castles up and these mangonels can't really push in here. Chris is able to stop this aggression from doing too much more damage at this stage. So Chris actually taking this, uh, sorry, Juan with a pretty solid squad lead. Chris kind of closed the gap and Chris actually now going up to the Imperial Age as well. Chris is not that far ahead up to Imp though because Juan 50 food away is going to be clicking up as well right now and there's what about 30 seconds in it if that. Um, yeah, there's like less than 30 seconds in it. And now I think this is going to get pretty interesting because Chris here with these two castles, sure he's going to be first to him, but at the same time, Juan is really not going to be far behind and he has two castles. So I think we might start seeing a little bit of a treb war coming in as these guys try to push each other's castles down. And bear in mind that um, 
Chris is going to be quite reliant on his castles here. Chris probably going to want to go down the Mangadai route. And you can see he's building his university now so he can get ballistics and all that good stuff. Um, probably going to want to go down the Mangadai route and maybe even going to start making some Mangadai fairly soon. But look at this from Juan coming in at the back. He's got all the way around the edge but it's totally worth it because he might find a few villagers. At the very least, he's going to push villagers away from these farms. He's going to delay this university. And with his Mangonel here, um, Chris can't really push out and fight these conquistadors either. But yeah, uh, obviously... A trebor probably going to come up at some point because Chris is going to want to make sure he takes down the castles of Juan so that Juan can't make too many trebs and kill his own castles. And Juan going to want to kill those castles to stop Chris massing Mangadai, of course. Mangadai, of course, incredibly, incredibly strong. Um, so right now, I mean, Chris not actually queuing any Mangadai out. So I mean, he's got to go down that route, you'd assume. He might go for some onagers. Um, onagers could be pretty effective as well. We'll have to wait and see. We'll hold on to our seats for a second and just wait for those techs to come in to really show us what he's going for. He's probably just saving for Elite Mangadai at the moment and go for Conscription and a Treb. But yeah, Treb War expected. Plan up to Imp. Trebs expected. They're coming straight out and there's very little time difference. But Juan, in my, in my book, has this uh, uh, fantastic advantage right now. And uh, with a third castle coming up on the front, he should be able to make more trebs as well with three castles versus two. Um, I'm not sure about Chris's eco as well. Uh, Juan does have 15 extra villagers. That's obviously a little bit more resource here to be able to build trebs with. And actually, I didn't notice, but Chris has got a third castle. So there are actually three castles each. And Chris, with his faster time to Imperial, faster to get out his trebs. Maybe he might get an advantage here, but we'll see. This castle under fire, and uh, Juan gonna try and repair that, but he doesn't have enough repairers on this castle yet at the moment. So, at the moment then, Siege Workshop's coming up for Chris, and with another one on the way, I'm expecting we'll, we might see, we might see some uh, either onagers, or maybe he'll upgrade rams. Either way, uh, it's going to work against whatever Juan is going to plan to do. Because Juan now doing skirmisher. He's doing ring archer armor. He's going down that route because he's anticipating. He's expecting Chris to go for Mangadai here. Juan losing his castle. And Chris is probably going to bust out here and actually gain some momentum. So Chris actually yeah, going to go ahead and do battering rams and capped rams. Which is going to be fantastic for him. Because he can tank up some of that conquistador fire. He can tank up what is soon to be skirmisher fire. And uh, I think this is going to be really interesting um, with Juan now being able to take down a single castle. But with the rams on the field, they can close the gap to these trebs. They can start taking these trebs down and um, that could be pretty nasty. In fact, Chris there, uh, sorry, Juan there losing a treb to these units and the, the treb on the right hand side from Chris. And there you go, the ram just getting in. Of course, he's taking a lot of damage from these conks. But able to take down a Treb, and Chris is going to take down another castle from Juan now. So, Chris pulling himself back into this game from what seemed like a pretty rocky start. Winning the Treb War, which is the first step to winning the game in this situation, I feel. And uh, obviously he's now being able to, he's going to be able to keep his castles safe. But as you can see, he's, he's really not emphasizing going Mangadai. He's not actually going down that route, which I think is kind of an interesting thing. Instead, he's currently doing scale barding armor because he's going, it seems, for light cavalry or down the light cavalry kind of route here. He actually just lost his light cavalry uh, upgrade, I think. I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, he's doing bloodlines now. I don't know if he actually managed to finish light cavalry, though. I get a feeling he didn't. Mm, not sure, actually. <laughs> Why am I delusional? Why? <laughs> but yeah, Treb War then, clearly, clearly going in favor of uh, Mr. Chris, and he did a really nice job of that. And with the scams coming out, um, you know, Chris maybe not going to want to throw some unupgraded Mangadai at that, but it's still probably worthwhile for him to do the Mangadai as the game goes on, because they're still going to be really strong uh, for raiding and things like that. He is also doing, like, cavalry, so, I mean, he's starting to form 
the, the standard kind of Mongol build order, uh, or the standard kind of Mongol build, which is that super buff-like calves, which, you know, super buff hussars, and he is starting to switch into Mangadai now. Uh, of course, Bloodline is going to affect Mangadai as well, so those research is coming in, but yeah, it's going to be a while before he gets Elite Mangadai here. He's not quite there with uh, the rest of the resources, though he's actually got a good amount of gold in the bank right now. Juan is going down the line. We did uh, Cavalier earlier. He's got a bunch of stables back here. He's doing bloodlines now. Mass skirms. And uh, back at home, plate barging armor, ballistics. So maybe, maybe we'll see him start to do some cabs. I mean, he's upgraded it for a reason. Paladin, again, that's a pretty long way off. He's not got the food. He's miles off the food count here. But uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's gonna be interesting because this combination of Mangadai and and uh, and light cavalry is so strong. Once he upgrades Hussar as well, it's gonna be even better because he can kill a lot of these skirms with the light cavalry up front, and then the Mangadai with their really fast fire rate and their their, their very high uh, DPS, gonna be able to absolutely hammer in from behind, do a lot of damage that way. Uh, I kind of like how uh, Juan down here though has walled this up, and he's kind of doing like a. A bunch of stables on this left side as well. Uh, he's also doing husbandry. He's doing forging. So it really looks like he's set on doing um, heavy cavalry or just uh, some kind of cavalry here. He's doing cavalier now. All right. So we're going to expect to see that in just a minute. And at this stage, I think if he makes a bunch of cavalier, this could be pretty good for him. Because these Mangadai are still ma uh, missing a lot of upgrades at the moment. But obviously, as the game goes on, Chris is going to get more and more Mangadai out. And it's going to become more and more difficult to kill them. In my opinion, anyway. <laughs> but Juan here, a very sizable army. He's keeping Chris, um, Chris's advance pretty slow. And this is a one-way gate for him. And I like this. This is really nice. This, this kind of uh, stable build down here. Because he can just pump Cavalier right into Chris's economy. Like, Chris didn't even know, I don't think, until a minute ago that this wall was here. And Juan walled this, stopped Chris from pushing out, and now he can just pump Cavalier into the back of his base. And Chris is really not focused on that right now. He's focused on this, which is going to be a big battle on the front of the map and the moment. Uh, Juan just doing the Paladin upgrade right now, so it was a while before he could get it. But he is certainly going to have it very soon, as Chris is doing Elite Mangadai here. So, this is a really kind of turbulent time for Chris right now. He doesn't want to lose any Mangadai at the moment because he needs that elite upgrade for these guys to become truly very effective. At the back of the map here, he's throwing up a castle to try and protect his eco and um, obviously some stables as well for some more Hussar or light cavalry for now. Chris, party and tactics. It, it's, it's a long process to get these Mangadai upgraded, but it is so worth it if he can mass them up. Still a lot of skirms though, and that's kind of scary. There's a Manganel here. Could do some good damage, but uh, in come the conks and down goes the mangonel probably. There you go. Skirms, way too many of them at the moment for Chris to realistically fight that head on with these um, mangonai. So where did these cavalier go? Well, they're in the back and Chris losing a few villagers. The villager count though is the big thing right now. Juan has still got 30 more villagers than Chris. He's still holding down the map control and uh, even though Chris won that little tread war there, Juan has rebuilt. He's building. He's got a bunch of traps on this right side. He's going straight for the castles. Paladin is done, and he's going to hit this timing attack now as he pushes in with uh, Paladin uh, ready to go. Uh, the Paladins here should kill a couple of these traps. The Mangadai at the back, though, are going to absolutely shred them up if they get uh, too close, but it's too slow. It's too late, and the Paladin's going to be able to get a few of these traps down, meaning that Juan can soldier on forwards with these traps. Military count for Juan is double that of Chris right now. And uh, like I say, it's a slow, long, and tedious process to get those Mangadai out and fully upgraded. And after winning that treb war, I think Chris felt a little comfortable. A little too comfortable. Paladin's done. And uh, you know, even though the Mangadai are incredibly strong, Paladin's uh, very solid too, and I think Chris is now being really distracted at the back of the map with these paladins just coming into his base and absolutely nothing he can do about that. He's kind of getting squeezed from both sides right now, and those trebs are going to absolutely destroy everything he holds dear. This uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, Juan doing cartography apparently. That's a misclick, right? Okay, why is he doing cartography? <laughs> Juan! 
Explain to me. Why cartography? Why? That's funny. Uh, anyway, mass trebs on the front. Down goes the TC. Chris is holding on, but I mean, this is Juan's game right now. He has got this in the bag. There is no question about it. No question about it. In my opinion. I, I, can't, I can't believe he didn't Carto though. That's like, it's just trolling, surely. Chris finally getting thumb ring. Uh, this is the thing, like, it's 52 minutes. He's still getting the upgrades on the Mangadai. As Juan pushes in with this massive, like, death ball almost for what he's up against. Mass Paladin and Skirm and Chris there calling GG. Waiting to see him actually resign. Maybe he's thinking of one last attempt with these Mangadai, but nope. He resigns and uh, Juan gonna get the game. Of course, um, you know, I don't think Juan would have got that if he didn't get cartography at the end there. Uh, it was definitely Carto that, that pushed Chris over the edge and to his demise, to his defeat. But what a great game from Juan. What a really good game from Juan there. Um, he played that one really well, actually. And I, I love the way that he came forwards with that castle. And although he, like, you know, although he lost that treb war, although he lost his own castles on the front and sort of fell back a bit, Chris never got any momentum from that. Sure, he won that war, he pushed it back, but he didn't gain momentum and he didn't carry on pushing. In the meanwhile, Juan was building this kind of forward at the back of Chris's base, just like free entry whenever he likes with paladins. And uh, Chris was just kind of pincered from both sides. And with all these mass skirms out, while Chris was trying to get those Mangadai upgraded, he couldn't really use them. The, the skirms would stop them dead in their tracks, and just a really well-played game by Juan there. I liked that game, and he's going to be feeling good about himself right now. Um, awesome stuff. Very, very good first game. And we'll update that scoreboard, putting 1-0 for Juan. And obviously now we'll come back, and we'll go into game number two.